guys join me so let me open the chat and everything that I see I don't hear anything yes you didn't hear because I have so many microphone settings I did not I did not switch it on yet now you should be able to hear me and you see me relatively crystal clear perfect now it's good I see the YouTube stream is running as well all right so just a couple of words because this is an unusual setting today so I'm streaming only my end of the call okay so that means you're not visible and you're also not really audible simply because uh, you don't wear a microphone like I do so I'm only picking up my end of the of the of the call so you don't need to be shy nothing okay um, that's the first thing the second thing the YouTube chat uh, the YouTube uh, stream has an automatic latency so a delay I think it's about a minute but sometimes the bitrate drops then it's maybe a little bit longer so I cannot really influence this okay uh, I'm also recording it obviously it's recorded within YouTube the moment the stream is complete it will become a normal YouTube video on the channel uh, the, the conversion on YouTube sometimes takes a few minutes, sometimes a couple of hours, uh, but it will become online in the course of today for sure. I'm also recording the whole thing in the cloud from the Zoom app just for, for a backup. So either way we will have the video, all right? Uh, with this out of the way, welcome back guys to our last lecture. Welcome to Delft, welcome to my living room. Um, I have prepared all kinds of things. Three things. First of all, we need to discuss our last chapter. It's, I told you it's, it's not meant as a focus, it's, it's meant to round off the curriculum nicely. Short-term finance. A couple of words, not like a whole big short-term financing strategy. I want to show you one specific kind of calculation. It's real easy, it's a beautiful cooking recipe and it makes logical sense. It will take us maybe half an hour. Quick break. And then I have prepared a theory bomb. What I, what I mean with this is I've gone through our stuff and just basically thought of what questions could I ask about this? What questions would I like to ask about this? So I've prepared a couple of questions across the board, including what I think are meaningful solutions. And for each sort of section, for each chapter where I have prepared questions, I end on some more questions that you can think about, okay? That's not for us to discuss now, it's just for inspiration to give you an, a bit of an idea how I think or how we think about the topic. And the third slide set I've created is called Theory Bomb 2. That's not for today, that's not something we will do now. That's what I will put on canvas probably tomorrow. It's the same setup, a couple of theory questions for you to go through, some with solutions, some without, just that you get a little bit more training material, more, more ideas in which direction to think, okay? So I would like um, that, we, that we start with short-term finance. We simply go through it. Obviously, as always, I make the slides available to you. Uh, brief break, theory bomb, and that's basically it for the day, all right? Let's do it. Ah, yeah, and as always, right, if you have questions, just unmute yourself and, uh, and let me know. Let me check a little bit the YouTube chat, yes. For the viewers, 161 viewers on YouTube, I love it. That makes me, even though I'm not a Twitch streamer or a YouTuber, I, that makes me very happy. Guys, in the YouTube chat, if you follow YouTube, you can interact with me. There's a bit of a delay, but if you send your question in the chat or your comment or whatever, I will see it, okay? I just need to switch my attention between the technical aspects, the Zoom chat, the Zoom call, the YouTube chat, and the actual content, okay? So, so cut me a little bit of slack. I'll do my best. Let's do short-term finance. All right. Let's have a look. So we, we keep saying casually, today we will talk about short-term finance. Yes, but I want to be a bit more specific. I want to introduce you to two specific concepts within short-term financing. The operating cycle and the cash cycle. The cash cycle is also referred to as cash conversion cycle or cash to cash cycle that are both relatively important metrics that can tell us something about essentially I would say the liquidity situation of a company how quickly a company is able to convert short-term assets into cash you will see it's quite quite interesting so there are a couple of events 
in the life of a company, in the life of a company that is producing a physical asset of sorts, some inventory, a product, and hand in hand with these events, the company has to make all kinds of decisions. Let's go through the events first. Obviously, if you are running a company, you're, you're running a company where you produce furniture, let's say, like IKEA. So obviously, you need to think like this. Well, I want to produce furniture. I need certain raw material. I probably need a lot of wood. I need screws. I need some glue, stuff like this. So you will need to think about, well, raw material. You will need to purchase raw material. You will also then, of course, get the raw material delivered from your supplier. The supplier wants to be paid. But when do you pay? Do you pay immediately in cash? Do you accept the raw material, the delivery, and then promise your supplier to pay a little bit later? Um, you then need to think about the manufacturing, oh, the manufacturing process. So that will also take a while, right? As you can see, all of this consumes time. You buy raw material, some time passes. Then the supplier shows up and drops the raw material. Then you need to pay, some time passes, and then you will really pay, some time passes, and then you have finally manufactured your product and you put it in your shop, in the shelves. Some time passes, and then I walk into your store, Oh, I like this product, maybe I'm gonna buy it. Again, some time passes until your customer, me in this example, purchases your product. And then again, because, well, I'm not a private dude, maybe I'm a company, so even though I have bought your product, I might have not paid cash. I might have told you, don't you worry about it, I will pay you next week or in a month. So again, some more time passes until I actually have paid you. So this whole thing here that I'm describing, all these events consume quite a bit of time from ordering your raw material until the last step where the customer who has bought the product finally has paid cash, there will be possibly a lot of time that passes. So which decisions do you need to make as a manager of a company in the context of these events? Well, number one, how much inventory are you even gonna order? How are you going to finance the purchase of the raw material? Are you going to borrow the money? Are you uh, paying cash immediately? Which production technology are you going to use? There's a lot of, uh, I mean, just this point we could discuss a couple of weeks. If you're interested in this, look up make or buy decisions, for example. Should, let's say I produce cars. Should I produce every component that I use in my cars? Should I produce it myself? Like for example, the engine. Should I build the engine for my cars from scratch? Or maybe it's better to purchase prefabricated engines. Maybe that's better. So if that's interesting to you, look up make or buy decisions. Not for the exam, just in general. Um, what terms do you offer the customer like me? Do you want that I pay cash? then yeah, you get cash immediately, but maybe I'm only willing to purchase less than if you don't extend credit to me. Or do you say, no flow, it's all right, buy as much as you want, as long as you pay within the next three months, everything is fine. Maybe that is better. And last but not least, how should you collect the cash? Very quickly, should you take your time? So the, the point I'm trying to make is, the whole manufacturing process, and that's what we're really talking about here, is relatively time consuming. And at every step here, a lot of important decisions need to be made. And just to give you a bit of extra information here, for example, question number one, how much inventory should you order? You could say, well, I'm uh, relatively risk averse, so I purchase as little inventory as possible, let's say raw material. Because you don't want to buy too much, you don't want to fill your warehouse with stuff that you might not end up needing, so you might not buy a lot of raw material. Okay, that's kind of risk averse, but what if your customers really like your product and it's immediately sold out? Every further customer coming into your shop, you will have to tell, sorry bro, I'm out of inventory, I cannot sell to you. And if you're anything like me, if I go into a shop and they tell me, yeah, 
sorry, we don't have the thing that you want to buy from us, but we can order it and you can pick it up in two weeks. I'm already out of the shop again and buy it online. So maybe not having enough inventory is not a good thing. So maybe you decide to buy a lot of inventory. The downside could be if the, the taste of consumers changes, you sit on a huge stockpile of inventory and nobody is interested in this. So there are a lot of mistakes that the management of a company can actually make. All right. So these activities, everything I've described now, purchasing raw material, uh, manufacturing a product, trying to sell it to the customer, later on trying to collect the cash from the customer. All of that is, of course, time consuming, number one. And number two, all of this creates a, patterns, a pattern of cash inflows and cash outflows. Cash outflows because you have to pay your supplier, for example. Cash inflows, ideally at some point, there will be a cash inflow from your customer. So there will be all kinds of streams of cash that you need to manage. Okay? The problem is this. The cash flows are unsynchronized. So that means the cash outflow to your supplier does not have anything to do with the cash inflow from the customer. The customer and the supplier are different parties, different people, different entities. So it's unlikely that the cash flows will match on a timeline very nicely. They are unsynchronized. And secondly, the cash flows are uncertain. What I mean with this is you don't know exactly your future sales. You don't know how much of your product you will sell, uh, you will sell eventually. Okay, so these two bullet points cause problems. We don't know, first of all, the cash flows are unsynchronized. They, they don't communicate in that sense. There could be a significant liquidity gap. If you pay your supplier very early and you extend very generous payment terms to your customer, in between, there will be a cash flow gap. You have already paid the supplier. You have not yet received payment from the customer. Okay, so there's a, a finance gap that you need to somehow fill, all right? And of course, uncertainty, you know already by now, we don't like this. It makes planning very difficult. Okay, so that's the context of what we are discussing here. Okay, let's talk about the cash conversion cycle. The, it's called cash cycle, cash conversion cycle, or cash to cash cycle. What, what does that mean? First of all, the cash cycle, also the operating cycle, are metrics that we express in a unit of time, in number of days typically. So we're trying to measure how long something actually will take, okay? But what, what are we measuring? What is the beginning of what we are measuring and what is the end of what we are measuring? Let's look at this. So what is the cash cycle measuring? The cash cycle begins at the moment in time where you, the company, where you pay for the raw material that you have purchased from your supplier. So the first time you pay your supplier, you have the cash outflow to the supplier paying for the raw material. That's when the cash cycle starts and it ends with you, the company, collecting cash, of course in the context of your receivables, from your customer. So in simple human language, what is the cash cycle? It's a certain number of days, we are counting number of days, starting from when have you paid the supplier bringing raw material, let's say the wood if you're a furniture company, and when have you collected the cash until you have collected the cash from the customer, from me, who has purchased from you, I don't know, a new bed, a new table, a new wardrobe. That is what we measure in a number of days. Let me check in very quickly. Is this clear so far, guys? Let me see a bit in the chat. I, see, I only see a white screen. You only see a white screen. Wait a second. Let me, let me, let me have a look at... Ah, I think I can fix this. Give me a second, guys. I can quickly, I think, fix this. You need to, with stuff like this, you need to unmute yourself and talk to me, okay? Let me see. I can switch the brightness down. So, all right, let's see this, guys. Whoop, whoop. Have a look at this. How is this, guys?
tell me in the chat. It's better, better, better. Okay, it's very difficult because the smart board is of course a bright light source itself and I'm trying to film a very bright light source. That's, that's notoriously difficult to do with a camera. Yes, I can upload the slides of course, as always, yes. All right, content-wise, let me see, content-wise, are we clear? Okay, cool. All right, so what is the cash cycle? It counts in number of days. How long does it take from the point in time where you, the producing company, has paid the supplier for raw material? And it ends with me, the customer, physically, basically paying cash to you. Not a receivable, but really cash inflow into your pockets. And that we measure in number of days. But there is, of course, a gap between cash inflows and outflows. The, that is the problem. That is the problem of unsynchronized cash flows. You pay first and you collect later. The time in between is a finance gap that you somehow need to obtain financing for. Obviously, you want this finance gap to be as short as possible. All right? That is crucial. The gap, this finance gap, how long or how short it is, is determined by two things by the length of the operating cycle. I have not explained this yet. It's, too big. it's still on the agenda. And the trades payable period. So how quickly you pay your customer. I, I have a beautiful diagram, so I will explain this in much more detail. Very important. It makes logical sense. You pay your supplier, some time passes, you collect cash from your customer. This time, for this time, you need to obtain financing. This is where we say there is a finance gap. This gap should be as short as possible. Now, of course, we immediately have to ask ourselves, how can you make it shorter? And there are a couple of things. I, I say this now from a purely theoretic perspective. In my diagram, it will be much clearer and I will go back to this slide. But I already want that you keep this in the back of your head. You can reduce this finance gap by changing the inventory period, we will have to discuss what that is, the receivable period and the payable period, okay? This, none of this you will see is a new concept. You know this all from the, from the context of financial statement analysis, all right? Let me show you. What, is, what, what do all these terms actually mean in, in, in normal language? What is the inventory period? This is just definitions, okay? The inventory period is, of course, the length of time measured in number of days that it takes to order raw materials and produce and sell a product. All right. Again, in my diagram, it will be much clearer still. What is the accounts receivable period? You remember this from your first year finance course? That is, of course, the length of time measured in number of days that it takes you, your company, to collect cash from your receivables. So how long does it take for an account receivable to be converted into cash? Because that's what we are focused on here. We are focused on cash flows, hard, cold hard cash. What is the cash cycle? Well, the cash cycle is the time between cash disbursements, so cash payments, cash outflows basically, and cash collection, so cash inflows. Again, in my diagram, this will be much clearer. And last but not least, what is the account payable period? That is the length of time measured in number of days that the firm is able, that you, the firm, is able to delay payment on the purchase of raw material, of inventory. So how long, in human language, how long can you, dr I'm your supplier, I, I sell wood to you because you're a furniture producing company, what is the accounts payable period? Well, I show up, I have a new batch of raw material of wood for you. Obviously, I want to be paid for that. The accounts payable period tells us how long you are able to delay paying me. So how, how long can you actually wait? Brief check-in, is this clear, guys? Is this clear? Let me see in the chat. All right, seems everything is clear, perfect. All right, okay, and this is it. If you say, hey Flo, what's the most important slide of this chapter? This is it, 
okay? It makes perfect sense. Let me guide you through it, okay? So obviously everything you see here, all those orange lines, they are timelines, okay? We are operating here measuring number of days. How long does everything take? Let's go through all these points here. Obviously here you place your order, you the furniture, furniture producing company, call me, the supplier of wood at the Hayflow, please bring some wood, bring some raw material. Okay, so you place an order, some time passes and the stock arrives. Don't forget stock, don't confuse this here with stock as in shares. Stock is also a word for inventory, right? So if this confuses you, just call it inventory or raw material, whatever it is. You place your order, you tell me, hey Flo, I need whatever, 100 kilo certain wood. Some time passes and I deliver the wood. That is this period here, okay? Then, of course, you manufacture the furniture, the table, the bed, the wardrobe, all of this. What happens then? Well, the finished product, the, the finished furniture that you have produced stays a certain amount of time in your inventory. That is what we call here the inventory period. Because you cannot reasonably expect that you produce something and the moment you're done, the customer already will show up and buy it. So some time will pass where this thing, the, 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 the bed, the wardrobe, the table is sitting in your inventory until a customer shows up and purchases and buys your finished product. That is this year, finished goods sold, okay? But of course, it's not necessarily a given that the customer is a private dude like me who has to pay cash. The customer might be another company saying, I want to buy your furniture. However, I will not pay cash immediately. I will pay later. So they purchase your product, like we call it, on credit. Take the product now, consume the service now, pay at a later point in time. So that means from the moment you have sold your products, until you receive cash from your customer, some more time will pass. At the point in time where you sell the products to your customer, in your balance sheet, you will of course record that you have sold it and that your customer now owes you money if the customer has not paid cash, right? So you will record an account receivable. That's why this thing here is called accounts receivable period. It tells us, measured in number of days, how long does it take between you selling the product and you actually getting cold hard cash for the product that you have sold? Is this clear, guys? Does this make sense? The important thing here is that not everybody pays cash. It's totally possible that I buy your product and promise to pay at a later point in time. If you allow that, that would be a credit sale. Everybody understands this. In the chat, I see the question, is it good to eat eight oranges a day? I'm not a medical doctor, but I think it's a bit too much. It's just my two cents. All right. So this is this timeline here, okay? What is, what is relevant? What can we already diagnose now? What we can diagnose is we have now here the actual operating cycle. That's... Remember, there are two concepts I want you to internalize after today's lecture. What is the operating cycle and what is the cash conversion cycle? What is the operating cycle? You can see it here. The operating cycle starts when the company receives the invoice for the raw material that they have ordered and it ends when you receive cash. That is your operating cycle. And if you say, okay, but how can I calculate this now? It needs to be expressed in number of days. How can you calculate this? We are curious how long is this period here? It's obviously this period plus this period here, right? You will see this in my calculation. It's very straightforward. But then, of course, what is now the cash conversion cycle? The cash conversion cycle is, again, measured in number of days. It's simply the difference between on a timeline, when have you paid for your material here, cash paid for material, that's when you pay your supplier in cold hard cash. When does the cash conversion cycle end? When you receive cash from the customer. Again, 
Not when you create a receivable, but when you have received cold hard cash. Okay, so if we are thinking about operating cycle and cash conversion cycle, we ask ourselves, why does the cash conversion cycle matter? Because it's the nature of unsynchronized cash flows that they can cause finance gaps, gaps in our financing. Because sometimes we have to pay first before we earn cash inflows. So I have an interest, first of all, to figure out how long, over which period of time does this finance gap go? Obviously, how can I make it shorter? How should I finance this? And I need to be able to calculate it. So step one, I calculate the operating cycle, simply as this year plus this year. And I want to really figure out the cash conversion cycle. So how can I calculate that? Operating cycle minus the accounts payable period. That will give me the, only the cash conversion cycle. Does this make sense, guys? What is the gap? Yeah, I can upload the slides. Yes, I just cannot do this now at the moment because there's all kinds of technology going on. Yeah, I will upload in the break, of course. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's, let's do it, right? That's the only thing left. So this is the conceptual logic. This represents here an average manufacturing and sales process, I would say. We need to see how that plays out. So let me go back. What is the logic now of the rest of my slides? We will calculate all these different periods and then basically put it together. And again, what are we really interested in? We are really interested in figuring out the cash cycle. So how long, measure the number of days, will the gap be between us paying for the raw material and us collecting cash from the customer. I cannot do this directly. So step one, I need to calculate the operating cycle, the whole thing, as a, as a result of inventory period and accounts receivable periods. And from this, then I can deduct the accounts payable period. That's what we're gonna do, let's. So I have here just a brief example. We start with the inventory turnover ratio. There's not a lot I need to add here. That is first year finance. You have, of course, done financial statement analysis. So I will simply guide you through it very quickly. The inventory turnover ratio is calculated as costs of goods sold, whoops, divided by average inventory. This is quite important because sometimes when you see a balance sheet, it's not really clear which value should I take now. Should I take the inventory balance from the opening balance sheet, so from the 1st of January, or should I take the ending inventory at the end of the year, 31st of December typically. So we would actually, as practitioners, use the average. Beginning balance plus ending balance divided by two. Gives us an average, how much on average does the company have in inventory. That is my starting point, and that is then what I use in my formula, cost of goods sold, is of course the second position on the income statement, revenue or sales minus costs of goods sold. I can easily take it from the income statement, divide it by the average inventory, and I find in my example here, the inventory turnover ratio is 9.47. This is very difficult to interpret, I find. This is not number of days. Every ratio that is called blah, blah, blah turnover has a similar interpretation. This is the best I can do, I have to admit. The inventory cycle occurs 9.47 times per year. So if I try to translate this into human language, I'm all already struggling because it's a very abstract concept. I think I would say it like this. An inventory turnover ratio of 9 point, let's say 9.50, or let's be even more generous, let's say roughly 9, means mathematically it happens roughly nine times per year that the inventory is built up and decreased to zero completely. Okay, that's how you can picture this mathematically. That happens nine times per year. You fill up your inventory, you sell it. You fill it up, you sell it nine times. Is it good if the inventory turn ratio, turnover ratio is higher or should it be lower? What do you think? What is better for me as the firm, higher or lower? Send in a chat.
اللي هو اللي هو حياة حياة اللي هو حياة 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 alright it seems mixed opinions I mean ask yourself if you're a company what would you like do you prefer to sell your product like a lot or do you prefer to sell very little I th I mean could be I mean if you if you run some exceptional weird business normally I would say you want to sell as much as you can as often as you can so for you it would be better if the inventory is sold very quickly right you don't want to be a supermarket that has one year old milk on the shelves obviously it's better if if this ratio is more if the inventory turns more often during the year okay because it means you're selling more to your customers okay now we need to calculate let me go back we ne need to calculate this bad boy here okay so how long does the, the thing now stay in the inventory really from the moment we have finished production until a customer shows interest and purchases the, the item this here we need to calculate all right it's very easy that's called days in inventory period it's calculated as 365 days of the year divided by the inventory turnover ratio that's why we need the inventory turnover ratio I find it unpleasant to interpret the inventory turnover ratio alone but here I need it it's just means to an end really I'm interested in this here okay so 365 days of the year divided by the inventory turnover ratio so in my example that means 365 days divided by 9.47 the inventory turnover we have just calculated and the result will be 38.54 days immediately when you study something like this ask yourself in which unit is the result this is in number of days what does it mean in a full sentence the inventory cycle is slightly longer than 38 days so a little bit more than a month but this is not human language either what does this mean now let's go back let's look at my diagram what does this mean here the inventory period is slightly longer than 38 days what does this mean it takes roughly 38 days for the finished item in your inventory to lie around oops until a customer is willing and interested in buying it that's how long the thing stays in your inventory okay let me just check the chat quickly if everybody is on board okay yeah why don't we round up to 39 I would be very careful here with rounding because it depends a little bit what you're trying to do right you're trying to figure out how big is your finance gap okay so you probably don't want to round up you probably want to be conservative okay so it depends which metric here you calculate if you round up or down that is really then a matter of the actual metric you're calculating uh, so for example if I if I if I look at this here how long does it stay in my inventory 38.54 days here I would be in favor of rounding up because it I mean if I round up I make an rounding is an intentional mistake of course I if I round this to 39 days I'm basically making a mistake that implies that the inventory stays a little bit longer in the inventory than it really does would this be a problem no because a longer period days in inventory period is not good for me so by basically rounding up I'm being extra careful this year I would not round down okay okay so is this a good met is this a good result 30 38 days or 39 days what do you think is this a good result tell me guys I'm curious not good different opinions depends on the product depends on the industry yeah I think I think I like those two opinions uh, depends on the product and depends on the industry so imagine I am a shop and the only thing I produce is milk I don't know about you I, I love drinking milk I don't know for some reason I really drink a lot of milk so maybe I open a specialized milk shop 
imagine you calculate the days in inventory of the products that I have and the only product I have is different kinds of milk. And you calculate it for my milk store and you find on average a liter of milk stays in my inventory for 39 days. That would not be great. I mean, 40 day old milk? That's not really milk anymore, right? That's some super bad smelly cheese. I mean, in the best case scenario. If, however, I'm a company that produces tanks, you know, like tanks with, like for war. If I produce tanks, like Abrams tanks, the biggest tank in the world, and my inventory period is 39 days, that would be very good because a big tank is extremely costly. If I produce a tank and it stays in my inventory only for a bit more than a month, that would be crazy fast. So you're absolutely right, guys. You cannot never interpret a ratio, any ratio, not just this one, stand alone. You would need to compare it to the main competitor, to the industry. There's no way to say 39 days is good or bad in itself. Not possible, okay? All right, so that's the days in inventory period. Now we need to consider what's happening with our accounts receivables. So money that we are supposed to collect and what is happening with our accounts payables. So money that we are supposed to pay to our suppliers. So again, just like with the inventory before, we first would calculate the average balance of accounts receivables. Because at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year, that could be very different. So I will simply say opening balance accounts receivables plus ending balance accounts receivables divided by two, and that gives me an average accounts um, receivable balance of whatever, 857 million, irrelevant. Then, second step, I can now calculate the average receivables turnover. Remember what I told you about ratios that are called blah, 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 turnover? They give us this weird metric. The position was turning over so many times per year. It's quite difficult to interpret. So average receivables turnover is calculated as credit sales, so sales on credit, divided by average trade receivables, which we have just calculated. Just a brief word here, credit sales. When you look at a balance sheet, guys, uh, when you look at an income statement, I should say, the first position would be called revenue or sales, right? It's the same thing. You, you would actually have to dig a little bit deeper because you don't automatically know where that cash sales or where that credit sales. So many companies split this more detailed and say, okay, we had, uh, we had sales 100, of which 30 were cash sales and 70 were credit sales, something like this. If you don't find it immediately in the income statement, go back in the annual report, very close to the end of the whole report, you will have a section called notes. In the notes that are like footnotes, you find further information about the balance sheet and income statement positions. So if the income statement only says revenue, then go to the notes and look at the final split, how much of that was sold on credit, how much of that was a cash sale. We, we only consider obviously here credit sales because we are calculating here our receivable turnover. So if our customer has paid cash, it will not create a receivable, okay? So including here all sales would of course be incorrect, all right? So credit sales divided by average trade receivables as we have just calculated and we find the result is 6.17. What does this mean now? In what unit is this? Well, the unit would be times. You could say, what does this mean? Um, our receivable position turned 6.17 times per year. If you try to picture this, it seems to indicate that we built up our receivables and they were completely paid off about six times per year, all right? Okay, but this is not, this is again, not what we really care about. The turnover, blah, 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 turnover, is just means to an end. We really want to calculate now days in receivables. Let's do that. 365 days of the year calculated by the average receivables turnover. That's why we needed this, not to interpret the 6.17 standalone. This is an input parameter for the, for the days in receivable period that we really are interested in. So 365 days of the year 
divided by 6.17, the average receivables turnover, and that gives us 59.16 days. What does this mean now in a full sentence? How do you interpret it? It means, well, the, the, the um, days in receivable period is 59.16 days. That is on average the number of days it takes a customer, one of our customers, to pay their receivable. They have bought our product very clearly on credit, meaning we have handed over the product. The customer has not paid. Instead, we have created on the balance sheet, on our balance sheet, an account receivable. That guy still owes us money. And it takes the customer on average 59.16 days to pay for this. Okay? Days in receivable period. Okay? That's this here. Okay? So everything we are calculating are those different time periods. And again, the, the main idea is we need to figure out the length of the operating cycle only because we need this so that we eventually may be able to calculate this year, the cash conversion cycle. That is where we want to go. All right. Okay. So we need to still look at our payables. Step one, you see there's a pattern here. We calculate our average trade payables. So beginning balance plus ending balance divided by two because that could fluctuate over the year. This is a quick and dirty way to make sure that we have a neat average here. Is whatever, 785 million, all right. Then we calculate now the so-called trade payables deferral period. What is that? Let me show you in the diagram. It's a very fancy term, trade payable deferral period. That is the period that we can actually use to postpone, to delay, to extend our payments, okay? So that is this year, okay? How long can we as a company manage between us having received the raw material or the products from our supplier until we really have to pay the supplier? How long can we drag this out? All right. So we have calculated our average trade payable position. Now we calculate the trades payable deferral period. It's calculated as cost of goods sold divided by average trade payables. Cost of goods sold is of course the second position in the income statement. Average trade payable we have just calculated. The result here, 4.65 uh, as a result. We are not quite done yet. We need to convert this into days in payables. We are interested only, not in any turnovers, we are interested in number of days. So, 365 days of the year divided by trade payables deferral period. So, 365 divided by 4.65 and that gives us again what we want, something expressed in a unit of time in number of days. In my example, it's 78.49 days. So what does this mean? The interpretation here would be, on average, we as a company take 78.49 days to essentially pay our bills. That's what it means. Let me check the chat quickly if there's something immediately that I need to address. Yeah, could you please repeat what the trade payables deferral period tells us? Yeah. The trade payable deferral period is just means, oops, it just means to an end. This here is like all the turnovers before. It's difficult to interpret in a standalone way. The only reason why I calculate, I mean, think of it as a turnover ratio again, right? The calculation indicates it's some sort of turnover again. But I'm only doing this not to interpret the 4.65, but I need this here as an input parameter for what I'm really interested in, which is the days in payable period, okay? You see, I use the 4.65 here as, as an input parameter. And that is then something I can interpret easily because it's a number of days. So I myself think of this metric here as only means to an end. I have to calculate it 
so that I get eventually to the number that I'm really interested in and that I'm able to interpret number of days this year. And now it's only a matter of putting the pieces together. We have calculated all the different parts. Let's put it together and we're almost done. What is now the operating cycle? Let me show you again why we have to start with this. The operating cycle is this whole period, right? From the moment the inventory or the raw material arrives until we have collected our cash. That would be the operating cycle. We are really more interested in the cash cycle. But I cannot calculate the cash cycle or cash conversion cycle immediately right away. I need to go through the operating cycle first and then deduct this period here. That's the only way I can get the cash conversion cycle. Okay, so step one now, calculating the operating cycle. Okay, so everything we are calculating here, you can actually map out in the diagram, right? We have calculated everything bit by bit here. Okay, let's. So the operating cycle is calculated as days in inventory period plus days in receivables, right? Let's go back to my diagram. Days in inventory plus days in receivables. That's of course this period. You can see, right? We have calculated both. Uh, so that was 38.54 days plus 59.16 days and that gives us 97.70 days. What does this mean in a full sentence now? 97.70 days. Need to go back again. It means the time between our supplier has delivered our inventory or raw material until we collect cash takes 97 point something days. That's what we have figured out now. But this is means to an end. We really care about the cash conversion cycle. Don't forget. So this is now what we can do. The cash cycle or, or cash conversion cycle is calculated as the operating cycle, which we've just figured out, minus the days in payables. So operating cycle minus days in payables. The operating cycle is all of this. The days in payable is this year. And of course, as you can see, the difference is then here the, ca well, the cash conversion cycle, okay? So conceptually, that's not difficult. All those metrics that you see here are measured in number of days. How long does the product stay in the inventory from the moment we have finished producing it until the customer buys it? How much time passes between the customer buying our product and the customer paying for the product? How much time passes between us having bought the product and having received it until we have to pay the supplier? So that are the three metrics we are interested in. Everything else we have calculated, we needed to calculate to figure out those three metrics, all those turnovers, right? That's it. So let's do the last step, which is, oh, yeah, you see, it's the last slide already. Cash conversion cycle, that is what we really care about, is calculated as operating cycle, the whole thing, minus days in payables. So how long can we delay ourselves paying our supplier? So we have figured out that the operating cycle was 97.70 days, whoop, minus days in payables, that was the 78.49 days. So that gives us a cash conversion cycle of 19.21 days. So a little bit more than half a month. What is this number now for? What would I do with this number in reality? In reality, this is something I need to think about because realistically, so this here is 19 days in our example, because for this period of time, I need to make sure now that I have enough liquidity, okay, that I have enough cash on hand, cash and cash equivalents essentially, to be able to operate. A couple of questions for you now. Should the cash conversion cycle be as long as possible or should it be as short as possible? Short, short, short. Yes, beautiful guys, absolutely. Because I'm really asking you, would you rather need a, a, a loan for a very long time or for a very short time. Obviously, obtaining financing is costly. 
So you want to use financing only for as long as necessary, but as short as possible, right? So obviously it should be as short as possible. Yes, there was something in the chat I wanted to quickly address. Let me quickly scroll up. Dimitris asks, isn't it possible that the supplier requires payment when the order is placed instead of when the stock arrives? Yeah, it's a very good point. Absolutely possible. All kind of stuff here is possible. So what happens if our supplier wants a prepayment? Obviously, that would have an impact on our ratios here, right? I would like to discuss very briefly the best case outcome with you. Because based on the chat, what I'm seeing, this does not seem to give you any problems, which is great. Also, if you say you are a bit insecure in finance, I hate saying it, but I mean, you see, this is a cooking recipe. What, there's nothing that can go wrong. Do this three times and it's already boring, okay? So I have a question to, to, to tickle your brain a little bit. My let me get out of the image. My question is, if I'm a top manager, like I'm really skilled at this, okay? How short can I make the cash conversion cycle? You said correctly, shorter cash conversion cycle is better. Absolutely agreed. So how short can I really make it? What do you think, guys? If I'm absolutely hardcore as a manager, zero, I see zero. Ruben says negative, that's a hardcore opinion. I see a minus probably in the chat. Yeah. All right. Zero. Okay. Yeah, let's. Super guys. Yeah, that 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 is that is very that is very uh, very correct what you're saying. So what would it mean if the cash conversion cycle is zero? Let's talk about this first. It means basically that we pay our supplier the moment we collect cash from our customer, right? So that is certainly a good cash conversion cycle, I would say, because obviously you don't have here a finance gap. But could it be negative? Some of you seem to think so, and I say, yeah, I agree. The cash conversion cycle can become negative. What has to happen that it becomes negative? You need to you need to achieve that your customer pays for the finished product before you yourself pay your supplier. Then it becomes negative, yes. Is that possible? So that's how it mathematically works. The question is of course now, is it possible in real life? And the answer is yes, it's also possible in real life. It's not something every company can do, but it can be done. I would say a precondition for achieving a negative cash conversion cycle is a lot of market power. So imagine I'm a computer producing company and you are my supplier. And what you, because I'm a very big company, I produce a lot of computers. So what you do is you produce only a specific kind of computer chip that I use within my computers, okay? Then yes, you have a problem now. So companies like this really exist that produce something highly specialized that only one other company, one other customer can actually use. If that is the case, I can approach you and say, well, you are my supplier, you produce these computer chips that I need for the production. Uh, I want to renegotiate the terms of our contract. I actually would like that you keep all the inventory on hand. So when my customers come to my homepage, and customize their computers, I don't have an inventory at all. So when the customer customizes their computer, they are not really looking in my inventory, they are looking in your inventory. So the inventory stays with you, and only when I deliver then the finished computer to the customer, basically does it go through my house. So I will also ask you, I don't want that, you are, that your company is located in the United States. My factory is in Delft, I would want that your factory is on the other side of the street in Delft. I want a short delivery uh, distance. So basically I use my market power, the fact that you are 100% dependent on me as a customer, the computer chips you produce for me, nobody else can use. So you really have no choice. So I force you to essentially deliver very quickly. The moment I say jump, you 
run over the street with the computer chip I need. So that means I have basically outsourced my inventory to you. I will negotiate a very, very generous payable period. And the customer, when he, she, or they order a customized computer on my homepage, they immediately have to prepay it. So that means I get a prepayment from the customer. I get the payment from the customer the moment they click on purchase customized computer, a couple of months probably, before you actually send an invoice, before I have to pay you. And that would end up in a negative cash conversion cycle. I have not checked it in a while, but for, for, a, t for a time, uh, Dell did exactly this. Dell Computers was able to do this. Okay, so the, the correct answer, not only theoretically, but also practically, can the cash conversion cycle, or what is the best cash conversion cycle? I would say, ideally, it will become negative. That would be the master skill. Is this pos possible in reality? Yes, it is possible. There are some requirements. You need a lot of market power because you need to persuade, and I'm sugarcoating the word blackmailing now, your suppliers to really basically carry the finance burden, right? You keep your inventory very, very, very light. It's, it's only in your balance sheet very light. Somebody else has to carry it. So you have outsourced it then to your supplier. They will not agree to this unless you have a lot of market power. Okay? Does this make sense, guys? Is this, is this a coherent thing? Is it not? Let me see. Question in the chat. Is it not beneficial to have a long accounts payable period, though? And therefore, a longer overall cycle? Yeah, it's not so easy for me to say. So is it not better to have a long inventory? Did you say inventory period? Let me check again. What was it? To have a long accounts payable period. Sorry. A long accounts payable period. Is that not beneficial? Yeah, that's beneficial. To drag this out, paying out your customer, uh, paying out your supplier as long as possible. That is good. But that does not cause you to have a long cash conversion cycle, right? This is what we deduct from the operating cycle to get the cash conversion cycle. So the longer this thing here becomes, the shorter this here becomes, logically, okay? If the operating cycle is long, that's not a concern to me. The cash conversion cycle is of concern to me, okay? So is it possible to have a negative cash conversion cycle? Theoretically, yes. Practically, also yes. Yes. Cool, guys. This is it, just a couple of words, like I, like I told you, just a couple of words, some additional aspects on short-term financing and how we, how we can look at it. I propose now the following thing, guys. We are a bit over time. Let's have a break. Shall we have a 10-minute break? Is, is a 10-minute break acceptable? Or do you need a bit more? Yes, 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 yes. All right, guys, super. Let's reconvene here. Let's be a bit generous on my watch. It's almost four o'clock. Let's reconvene here at 4.10, okay? 10 minutes past four. I will leave the stream on. I will leave the Zoom call on. I just mute and switch the camera off, all right? Guys, I see you in a few minutes.
All right, guys, slowly come back to me. Nice, that's also, Sarah, I, I like your technical setup. That's very clean. I could use advice on how to clean my desk from you. Damn, nice. <laughs> Join me, guys. <coughs> Is everybody back? All right. Can't see you yet, guys. Where is everybody? All right. Switch your cameras on, guys. And let's do it. I have, I have a theory bomb. Like I said, I just want to go through a bunch of theory questions that I can think of. Some of them I have specifically created. Some of them were on old exams. So it's a wild mix. Everything here, in my opinion, could easily be on your exam. Every single question I have on my slides. I would feel very comfortable asking you on an exam, okay? Uh, obviously, not every exam question is equally easy or difficult. I mean, first of all, that's very subjective to begin with. Um, usually, Celine and me try to, to have a split roughly. 25% 20, of the questions, relatively easy. 50% medium, 25% a bit more challenging. We want exams that are discriminating, meaning Students that spend a lot of energy on coming to class, studying, should get higher grades than students who do not. That's what we mean with discriminating. That's why the questions are of different difficulty, of course, right? I saw a couple of questions about this uh, in the chat. Um, we, we, both Celine and me, are interested in big picture stuff, right? There is no sense in forcing you to study a footnote from page 726. It's a random number, okay? I just said some number. Uh, because that's you forget this five seconds after the exam anyway. And to be very honest with you, I don't know all these details either. I want that after our course, after you graduate, that you have a, a, a decent fundament of, of modern corporate finance. If you then later in your professional life, in your master stumble over details, of course you will need to study a little bit, look up certain things that is not supposed to be on the exam in this level of detail, in our opinion, okay? Before I want to, before the, the theory questions, I would like to give you a couple of general tips, if you will, about the exam, okay? So I've made some bullet points. They are more for me to know what I should tell you here, okay? Let's go through it. First, first I think, piece of advice I have for you. Before you start answering any questions, Click through the whole exam and see what you got, okay? There is no sense in starting with question one just because it's coincidentally question one. We are not thinking about a specific order. Uh, I think it's also randomized as far as I know. There is no, it's not like in the gym, the first exercise we do a little bit easier and then we go heavier. It could be that the first exercise coincidentally is the most difficult one. You spend an hour on it and you screw it up. It will shatter your self-esteem, you will waste a lot of time. None of this, this needs to happen. Check out very quickly what is it that the exam wants of you and classify it in your head quickly in that is easy and immediately get the easy stuff done. In the end of the exam, leave where you say I'm not really sure about it, this is a bit more difficult, leave this till the end. If you then run out of time, you have at least locked in all the points already from the relatively easier questions, okay? Uh, just to be sure about this point, I, I talked to Celine this morning, just to confirm, 
will it be possible for you on the exam to go forward and backward on the exam? Because as you know, that is not always the case on exams, right? And Celine told me she has instructed the technical team that is setting up ANS for us, for you, um, that it is possible, but she will double check again. Okay, so there will be, there will be some, uh, Celine will address this as well. We want that you can go forward and backward on the exam. There is no purpose in not allowing this, okay? But please, if Celine does not immediately address it herself in the workshop, please remind her, did you check with the technical team? Is this definitely possible, all right? Don't waste time on difficult stuff in the beginning. Easy stuff first, then medium, then difficult. That's how it, I think, should be. Secondly, don't leave any question unanswered. If you don't know it, you know we don't have negative points. Sometimes on some exams in some university that is done, if a student gives a grossly wrong answer, you can actually deduct points, but we don't do this. So that means if you leave an, uh, an answer empty, it's guaranteed zero points. If you write down the best you can do, there might be some points, okay? So you can only win. Don't leave anything blank. What else? If you're unable to, comp no, let me start differently. You know some of the calculation questions especially involve several steps, right? Calculate first this. Once you have this, you can then calculate this and then this and then this. So if you're unable to complete a specific step in a calculation, especially of course early on in a calculation, then do not stop, do not panic, do not throw your nerves overboard. That can happen, that happens to me. You just see exercises I have prepared at home and then I show them in the classroom, nicely color-coded, 50 times reviewed, then it looks great. If you watch me calculate myself, I screw up all the time. I constantly forget brackets. I constantly drop the initial minus in net present values. All of this stuff can happen to the best of us. That doesn't mean you're stupid or I'm stupid. That's just normal human, you know, human error. Don't stop if that happens. If you don't know a step, what should you do? Then invent a number. I would assume a result and continue with this. Brief example. Let's say I'm calculating, um, what's a good example? No, you tell me. Guys, give me an example from the workshops where you think it's a long calculation. I need an example quickly. WACC, thank you, super. Yes, perfect. You're calculating a long WACC or you want to calculate a long WACC, but for some reason you cannot re uh, recall anymore how to calculate whatever, cost of debt. Don't stop, I mean, this is very early in the calculation. If you don't manage this, you cannot continue. Then I would simply say, I would probably write down, I forgot the formula, whatever, I assume the cost of that is X percent and I will continue calculating with this. You will not get full points for this, but if you then continue the calculation correctly, you will get some points, okay? That is what this is about, okay? So don't panic. I mean, be as cool as you can. Can I do this? If not, I, I assume a number and this is what I continue working with and have, have um, be a little bit sort of user friendly and write down I cannot do cost of debt in my example, therefore I assume it's X percent. This is what I will work with. That's easier for us to grade. We immediately get what's going on, okay? Don't stop. Formula sheet. We spoke about it a little bit. I checked, of course, with Celine again to make sure that we're all on the same page. You may bring the following thing. One piece A4 paper. You can write on it anything you would like, front and back. You can write this on the computer, you can write it with your hand. I also checked with Celine about font size. We have no font size requirements. So theoretically, you can write very small. It's possible, all right? However, is this a good strategy? I think not, and certainly Celine doesn't think not. I assume, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing now, but I, I guess you could, if you make the font really small, copy paste, I mean, whole chapters of the book, Will this help you on the exam? I think not, because if you do this, you will, I mean, if you need to look up every single thing, you will very likely run out of time. I mean, brutally so, okay? So that I th it's up to you, 
put on, on your sheet whatever you like. In the past, we very often had open book exams even. That is not an advantage automatically, okay? So don't think, I don't need to study, I have carte blanche, I can write down whatever I like, which you can. Don't forget, the clock is ticking, and if you need to look up the most basic things on your one page, I don't want to call it cheat sheet, let's call it formula sheet, then you will just run out of time with calculation number two probably, I think, okay? Uh, so, so think about really what you want on your sheet. But in principle, it can be a formula, it can be text, it can be funny drawings, anything is allowed, okay? So, then the next bullet point will not make sense to you. That's just a trigger for me to tell you a specific piece of information. I wrote down A equals B plus C is that one calculation. So I noticed when we chat and also in our WhatsApp chat or in our Telegram chat that a lot of you start questions with which formula did you use? Which formula did they use? And Selena and me sometimes speak and say what are, what are the guys talking about? What, how many formulas do they think we have? So our impression is that your impression is that there are way more formulas than we really have. Okay, so Selina and me were really thinking, what do you possibly want to write on your formula sheet? Because there is not all that much. I would write down black shows myself, for example, and, and a couple of those things, but I would be very hard pressed to write down more than, let's say, 10, possibly 15 formulas. There is not more. So I think what is going on is actually this. When I look at a calculation, when Celine looks at a calculation that has a format like this. So let's say it's workshop and she, Celine shows you a calculation where you have to calculate whatever concept A and the calculation is A is calculated as B plus C. Then if I look at this, okay, well, you can say this is a formula. I write on my formula sheet. If on the exam I have to calculate A, I will do this by adding B and C. I think what happens when you see a permutation of this, many of you don't see that it's the same thing. So we do, let's say, a calculation of that form. Then later on, we simply rearrange this and say, please calculate C now. That would, based on this formula, C would be calculated as A minus B. In my mind, that's still the same calculation. In the mind of, I think, many of you, that's like a different thing that requires a different formula. It's not a different formula, it's just the same thing rearranged, okay? So theoretically, I can ask you about this calculation three questions. I teach you how to calculate A and I explain it's calculated as B plus C. On the exam, I can give you A and C and say, please calculate B. Or I can give you uh, A and B and ask you to calculate C. That is still all the same calculation, okay? So I noticed this, especially in the context of WACC calculations, all of a sudden there's a different formula. There's not a different formula. If you have a company that doesn't have two sources of capital, but three, they have a bond outstanding, they have uh, preferred shares outstanding, and ordinary shares outstanding. And you're supposed to calculate a WACC. It's still the same thing. It's not a new formula. You just have now three components, meaning you have three weights, right? But it's still the same thing, right? It's then the weight of equity multiplied with the cost of equity plus the weight of preferred equity multiplied with the cost of preferred equity plus the weight of debt multiplied with the cost of debt multiplied with one minus TC. That's not an all new uh, formula. It only seems like this if you did not really understand the WACC logic. We simply ask ourselves how much of this source of financing do we have multiplied with how much does this source of financing cost plus all the others, okay? So try to understand the formulas because then you will just need a lot less. Let me see if there was something in the chat I need. Is it true Black Shoals will be given by Excel on the test? I don't understand the question, what that means, to be honest. Will Excel be available only for selected questions? We can access it for any questions. Everything, I mean, honestly, in the context of calculation questions, I would really prefer that you ask Celine. I'm happy to address theory stuff, but workshop calculations is Celine's domain, okay? Um, all right, let's, let's go first maybe through my part and then I'll look at your questions, okay? 
So long story short, try to understand the nature of the calculation rather than treating every exercise like this is a whole new thing. This here are three possible questions, okay? So we can easily just rearrange a calculation and make it seem like it's a new question, but it's the same thing, it's just rearranged. And last but not least, and I think this is one of the most important thing is this. I just wrote it down for myself, which content to expect. Let me address this briefly. Now I know from conversations with you and from, and from, and from the questions that you're also asking now in the chat, you seem to worry about a specific thing. You seem to think, okay, I as a student study all kinds of different topics, but what if on the exam I get a question that pertains to a topic that I have not studied? Theoretically, that can happen. Yeah, sure. Is it likely though? I think it's not likely. I think the opposite is very likely. Let's talk about what I mean with this. What do I mean with the opposite is more likely? Let's talk briefly about what we have discussed. We have done Modigliani-Miller for a couple of weeks, right? A couple of weeks of Modigliani-Miller. Everything capital structure, without taxes, with taxes, and then reality, trade-off theory, packing order theory, dividend policy. So just uh, Modigliani-Miller, everything capital structure is already a lot, right? So let's say I want an exam to make sure that each and every one of you has studied all of this. So then I give you one question, Modigliani-Miller, no taxes. One question, Modigliani-Miller, with taxes. One question, trade-off. One uh, question, packing order. One question, dividend policy. There are already five questions. It's a two-hour exam. And that is just what we discussed about capital structure. But then I want a valuation question. I want options. We have discussed options for three lectures. I want that there is a replicating portfolio. I want that there's risk-neutral pricing. I want the black shows. I want maybe a little bit uh, about the cash conversion cycle. But it's a two-hour exam. So I think it's extremely unlikely if you study normally as I would expect of a normal average student, following the lectures, reviewing the lectures, going to the workshops, practicing workshop exercises, I think it's extremely unlikely that you will encounter an exam question you have never heard of. Like I said, I think the opposite will manifest, that you realize we have discussed so much content that it's not possible to ask every single thing, even the big topics, the most important topics, we cannot cram in a two-hour exam. So very likely on the exam you will experience that you say after the exam, now wait a second, I've studied all kinds of chapters. There was actually nothing about this on the exam. There was nothing about this. Of course not, because we cannot ask everything that we have discussed, okay? So don't obsess too much over weird details from page 726. Think the other way around. We have covered a lot of ground. We have discussed a lot of stuff in relatively great detail. And already covering only what we have discussed in class on a one, two hour exam is not possible. So you will very likely experience the opposite that after the exam, maybe you will even be a bit disappointed. Oh man, I've practiced this so well and there was nothing on the exam of that, okay? That is more likely simply because of how much we have discussed, okay? Is this clear, guys? Do we have to, so all, all the questions that go in the direction of do I have to study X, Y, Z? I always have the default answer. We're very short before the exam now. The default answer is the course manual says exactly which content of the book is fair game on the exam, right? And that counts. My personal preference and Celine's personal preference you know really well. We are big picture people. We want that you understand big picture. Not obscure details, big picture stuff. Is it possible that you find stuff in the book that is difficult, that we have not addressed in great detail? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a book that is that fat. It's like Game of Thrones. Of course that's possible, okay? Is this gonna be dominating the exam? Of course not, okay? Does this make sense, guys? Is this, is this clear what I'm saying? Let me check the YouTube chat briefly. Practice exam, is there gonna be a practice exam? I think of this here as a practice exam. It's a selection of realistic exam questions. Some of them we had on, in the past on the, on the exam. Efficient capital markets, it's called efficient market hypothesis, is not covered this year, Co correct, it's not covered this year. Um, 
Questions like Celine told me XYZ, is this really true? I find mildly offensive because it indicates to me that you think I have more credibility than Celine. Celine and me are a team. We work on this together. We discuss what we do. If Celine says A, don't come to me and expect me to say B, okay? That doesn't, that if Celine says something, it's the law, basically, also in my world, all right? Okay, let's look at a couple of questions, right? Have a look at this. So on the exam, you would not, you would not have like a, a beautiful heading, of course. Have a look at this. First question, give a brief description of the cap M beta. What does beta represent within the cap M framework? Perfectly straightforward question. Question B, list and describe at least two determinants of beta. You've heard this in your first year course. You've heard it in Celine's refresher. And you can look on the YouTube channel at my old lecture about this, okay? What does the expression cyclicality of revenues refer to? And what does the expression variability of revenues refer to? This all stuff from the recap session, nothing fancy here. Let's go through it. Give a brief description of the cap and beta. What does beta represent in the cap M framework? Now let's look. Beta is a measure of volatility. What does that mean? It's a measure of systematic risk, of a security, or of a whole portfolio. What is a security? Security is a fancy word for a financial instrument. And financial instrument is fancy language for something like a stock, like a bond, that I can buy and sell, that represents certain rights and obligations. It's a measure of volatility, of systematic risk, in comparison, so relative, to the market as a whole. The market as a whole, that could be an index, for example, right? RM, the market portfolio. All right. What do we do with it? Well, beta is used, of course, in the cap M, where we are calculating the expected return. More correct here would be the required return on an asset based on its beta, so based on the firm-specific risk, and based on expected market returns. Last but not least, just for terminology reasons, Beta is sometimes also referred to as the beta coefficient. No, super straightforward, full points. List and describe at least two determinants of beta. So what makes it that some companies have a high beta and other companies have a low beta? What are the drivers of beta? No, let's. Cyclicality of revenues is one driver. What does this mean? So what does cyclicality mean? What does it mean to say a company's earnings are very cyclical? It means an industry that you consider to be cyclical is an industry that is sensitive to the movements of the overall business cycle. So if a company is very cyclical, if a company has, is experiencing high cyclicality of revenues, what it means in human language is if the whole economy, the whole market, is doing very well in an expansion phase, a company with high cyclicality of revenues will earn very high revenues. In a downturn phase of the economy, where the, where the economy is contracting, uh, a recession, a depression, the, a company with high cyclicality of revenues will earn lower revenues. So it moves like the business cycle uh, makes the same movements. Beta is, of course, the standardized covariance of a securities return, it's just textbook now, with the market's return. So it's not surprising that a company that is highly cyclical, whose earnings are highly cyclical, will have a high beta. Because that is what beta is itself measures, right? The stock returns relative to the movements of the market. Obviously, this means a company with very high cyclicality of revenues will have a high beta. Does this make sense, guys? Let me have a look at the chat quickly. Yeah, guys, I cannot answer questions like, will we have to explain that much about beta's drivers? I'm, I'm showing you example questions that you get an idea what kind of questions we ask, what's roughly the level of detail I cannot, obviously, for obvious reasons, I cannot say, yes, guys, this is exactly like this on the exam. Of course, I cannot do this, right? All right. 
What does the expression cyclicality of revenues refer to? Well, that's basically what we've discussed. Let me show you. What does the expression variability refer to? The difference between cyclicality and variability. It's not the same thing. This is a question I would say, I, don't, I would not say it's very difficult, but this is clearly something that aims at something, I, I would not say it's a detail, but this is not something where I say, yeah, obviously that's like absolute super basics. That's to say, what are the impact parameters, the input parameters, the main drivers of a standardized covariance? That's not basic stuff in my view, okay? So what is variability of revenues? Let's go to this. Where is it? Variability. So it makes sense because the two concepts, cyclicality and variability, are very easy to confuse. So let's talk about this for a second. We've just discussed what cyclicality means. A company with cyclical revenues typically would do well in the expansion phase of the business cycle and it would do poorly in the contraction phase of the business cycle. All right. So is this the same as variability? The answer is no. I have a cool example here, I think. So if you imagine a company, a film studio, like a Hollywood studio, okay, what they do is they produce movies. So if you consider a, a Hollywood movie studio, they will have very highly variable revenues, meaning sometimes they produce a movie and the revenue will be absurdly high and sometimes their revenues will be very low. I think a good example would be Marvel. You remember a couple of years ago, all the Marvel, Marvel movies were record-breaking, right? I mean, Avengers, Endgame, stuff like this, like one billion and more revenue. But now they just released the Marvels and that was a huge box office flop, right? So that means a movie studio like Marvel has very variable revenues, so they fluctuate a lot, but they don't fluctuate in sync with the business cycle. So their fluctuations don't depend on the phase of the business cycle, but it depends more on the quality of the movie. In reality, of course, you can say it doesn't depend on the quality of the movie, it depends on the advertising that the company is doing, blah, 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 sure. But just to demarcate those two concepts, cyclicality means the company's earnings are influenced by the phase of the business cycle. Variability means earnings fluctuate, but depending on something else. In my example, depending on the quality of the movies, not on the phase of the business cycle. Okay? All right. And as I've told you, for each section we discuss, a couple of words about CAPM, a couple of questions we discuss now quickly together. It's just recapping, of course. And I end with a couple of additional questions that you can think about in your exam preparation. So what are cool questions here? Like I said, I just sat down and thought, what could I ask my students realistically on an exam? What would be a meaningful conversation topic? What would be an upper limit? Could there be an upper limit for beta? If yes, how high would it be? Could there be a lower limit of beta? If yes, what could it be? Can a beta be negative? If yes, what would a negative beta indicate or imply? What is the formula of beta? That's something I would not ask you. That's just something that crossed my mind as I was sketching out possible questions. I would not ask you as an exam question to throw up a specific formula. In reality, I would look it up and in reality, you would look it up. This is, this is for completeness sake, I would not ask this specifically. But the formula of beta and can I actually apply it? Am I able to fill in the correct values? How would this actually go? Oop. Give examples of firms that have a very high beta or firms that have a very low beta. And additionally, an explanation. Remember, we care that when we ask you something that you can substantiate your answer. I don't want that you simply make statements that are evidence-free. That's what a university is about. Everything we do, everything we say should be backed up by evidence. So if I ask you, give examples of high or low betas, firms with high or low betas, why do you think that they will have a high beta or a low beta? How could you at attempt to answer this? Now, yeah, if you think a little bit about what are the drivers of beta, 
like I'm saying here on the previous slides, movie studio, stuff like this, okay? Like I said, this is not a complete list, it's just a little bit of brainstorming. What would be feasible questions to ask in the context of beta, okay? Let me have a look at the chat very briefly. How many questions will be on the exam? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Students always ask and I usually have to really say I don't know because it doesn't really matter. It's, it, if it's six questions or eight or 10 or 12, it will not have an impact on your study strategy whatsoever. So I don't, I've seen the exam, proofread the exam, I don't recall it at all. It's like a normal two hour exam, handful of questions theory, handful of questions calculation. The number of questions has no bearing on your, on your study in my opinion. That's why I, I, I just don't know. Now let's look a little bit. This is a chapter where we said this is for, for reading only. Couple of questions here. There's nothing fancy, it's just terminology. Like I told you, read the chapter. If there are questions, by all means, ask me. N nobody asked me anything about it and I also would not know what because it's a reading chapter, it's very straightforward. So a couple of questions that I can, if I force myself, extract from this chapter. What are authorized shares? What are outstanding shares? Is this the same thing? If not, what's the difference here? Are dividends a form of a business expense? What does the term seniority refer to? And last but not least, I remember this very well, this was a real exam question. I remember it, I think in my first year at RSM, probably a decade ago, after the exam, a student filed an exam board complaint and said this is an unfair question to ask. And I won the exam board complaint in two and a half seconds by opening the textbook and holding it to the exam board showing that there is literally a chapter called is convertible debt, uh, is, is, is a preference share debt in disguise, okay? So this is literally the heading of a whole chapter in the book, okay? So let's go through it. What are authorized shares? What are outstanding shares? Let's talk about this briefly. So we already know, of course, all what shares are, right? They, are, they represent ownership units of the corporation. If you buy a share of Apple, it means you own now a part of Apple itself. And important as a legal thing, the Articles of Incorporation, so the, the legal document, basically the birth certificate of a company, must state the number of ordinary shares that the corporation is authorized to issue. So it could say the Florian Maratona company is authorized to issue 100 shares. Does that mean that the Florian Maratona company has issued now and therefore has outstanding 100 shares? No because I have authorized shares, meaning the shareholders gave me permission to issue up to 100 shares in my example. It does not automatically mean that I really have issued all of them, okay? That could be that I have issued half of them, 50. All 100 are already authorized, so if I as the manager later want to issue some more equity, I don't need extra permission, I can immediately do it basically, okay? So authorized shares is how many shares are you allowed to really issue. That does not mean that this is the same number of shares that is already outstanding. Are dividends a form of business expense? Also, sorry, brief side note, brief disclaimer here. When I try to answer the, the questions I'm asking here on my own slides, I don't want that you think now, okay, if the question is what are authorized shares, I have to write Oops, I have to write this whole story, otherwise it's wrong or not full points. What I have done is I try to answer the question and provide a little bit of background information that you can refresh the whole context a little bit, okay? So I don't want that you think that this question requires this whole narrative to be answered correctly. No, this is way more. Are dividends a form of business expense, yes or no? The answer is absolutely not. Dividends are not a business expense. I know this because dividends are not deducted in the income statement before we calculate taxes, right? So we calculate revenue minus all our expenses, minus cost of goods sold, is the gross profit, minus all the other stuff. Eventually we end up at the EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. 
Then we deduct interest expenses. That gives us the EBT, so earnings before taxes. On this number, we calculate the tax expense and deduct it. And the result is then earning after tax or net income. Where do I deduct dividends? Not from here. The net income is moved into the retained earnings. And if I then declare a dividend, I take the dividend payment, the cash, the, 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 the capital, out of the retained earnings and pay it to the shareholders. So that means they are not tax deductible. They are paid out of the retained earnings. They are paid from what you have generated in terms of net income. Dividends are paid out of after-tax profits. They are not an, an expense. Okay, They are not tax deductible. Let me have a look at the chat. Are the weekly bonus quizzes representative for the theory question on the test? I think the questions I'm, I'm, I'm showing you here are representative for the theory questions on the text. Do you need to answer the questions in Dutch or in English? So in IBA, you need to answer in English simply because our, uh, our team of assistants in, the, uh, in IBA are not necessarily native speakers of Dutch. In BA, we are typically a little bit more flexible. So officially, it's a Dutch exam. The questions are in Dutch. You are studying in a Dutch program. Uh, so you are expected to answer in Dutch. However, we are fine if it's in English. What I don't want, so if you say I, I, it's easy for me to talk about the Cap M in English, sure. One thing you cannot do, and that is really, I'm, I'm very serious about this, please don't um, mix Dutch and English in the same answer. Because of course there are many words that are similar or identical with slightly different meanings. And I mean, if that would go to the exam board and we argue about the meaning of one word and you say, yeah, but here I switch to Dutch and here I switch back to English, that, that cannot happen. If you answer a question fully in English, another in Dutch, perfectly fine. It's no, no big deal for us. Yes. Yes. All right. Oh, I wanted to see what, are, what else what do we have in the YouTube chat? Weekly, are they weekly bonus? Yeah. Uh, will we have Excel on the exam? Yeah, Celine, uh, Celine and me spoke about this. She's in touch with the technical team. Um, because on ANS exams, you can implement something that looks a little bit resembles Excel. Um, so we are in the process of figuring out if that is usable or not. What it, what it means is, it doesn't matter if it's usable or not. We pay attention to that the questions we ask can realistically and in an in a, in a ethically okay way be answered by normal students with the tools they have. So I would not give you, let's say, for example, a huge covariance calculation. Calculate the covariance between a stock and the market over five years, daily stock returns, but you have no Excel. There's, there is no purpose to this. Okay, So whatever, if it's with Excel or without the Excel, the questions will be asked in a way that you can answer using the tools that you have. But in the workshop, until the workshop with Celine, we will have this information from the technical team and then she will be able to tell you, yes, you will have it or no, you won't. Okay? Oh, yeah. Then uh, let's... What, what else do we have? What does the term seniority refer to? You read this in the newspapers often. What is this? Seniority indicates preference in position over other lenders. What does this mean in human language? This is just fancy language for seniority means... I go bankrupt, I'm a company, I go bankrupt, everything is liquidated. Where in the waiting line in front of me are, are you? If you, uh, you, you are an investor with a high seniority, you have bought financial instruments from my firm that gives you a, a, a very high seniority, you will be very much to the front of the waiting line. If not, you're at the back of the waiting line. Okay. Some debt is subordinated. That means it is sort of less high priority than others. In the event of default, so if the company goes bankrupt, holders of subordinated debt must give preference to other specified creditors. What does this mean in human language? It means if you are holding subordinated debt, you're further back in the waiting line if I go bankrupt. Other people will be in front of you. The one with... A higher seniority, okay? 
Usually, yeah, what usually that means subordinated lenders will be paid off only after specified creditors, creditors with a better seniority, have been compensated. If there's not enough money to compensate the others, holders of subordinated debt don't get paid. They suffer the damage. Last but not least, debt cannot be subordinated to equity. Okay? Equity, by, by definition, is capital at risk. If you are my shareholders, if you were my shareholders, and we are hanging out in Delft and chatting a bit, and you say, hey, listen, Flo, honestly, I'm a little bit worried about, about the state of the firm. It seems somewhat likely that it will go bankrupt. And imagine then I say, okay, how about this? I understand your worries. Let's just, you and I, I'm the CEO, you're a shareholder, you and I, let's just have a written agreement, I will sign it, that says, even if the company goes bankrupt, I, the CEO, will pay back, from the company's money, of course, your equity investment in our firm. If I were to do this, I would go to jail, okay? Because equity, by definition, is capital at risk. Any agreement in which I guarantee to pay you back your capital at risk, your equity, is not legal, okay? So debt cannot be subordinated to equity. That means shareholders cannot be reimbursed before debt holders. Equity holders, shareholders are the last in line, always. Uh, last but not least, what was the last question? Oh yeah, a good case, that's literally the wording from the book, a good case can be made that preference shares are really debt in disguise. Make that case. So make that argument. That is a question I would not consider easy anymore. It's not unfair or anything. But this is something where I think, yeah, okay, this, this is some, something where scientists argue a little bit about. Asking this on a high pressure exam, that is not for the faint of heart anymore. So I would not classify this as an easy question myself. The question is, preference shares can be viewed as debt in disguise. How would we have to argue to show that it could be debt in disguise? In order to do this, we first need to say what are preference shares and to what degree do they resemble debt, right? So let's do this. What are preference shares? They are not ordinary shares. When we speak in class, oh, the share price, share price up, share price down, would you buy this share? We always, by default, unless we specify differently, talk about ordinary shares. Preference shares are not ordinary shares. They're something different. Preference shares represent, of course, equity as well. They are still shares after all, but they come with special features. They are preferred in the payment of dividends and in the assets of the corporation should the company go bankrupt. So it's very similar to buying shares. You buy shares, you become an ordinary shareholder, or you buy preference shares, then you become a preferred shareholder. All right. What are these things now? What happens to you if you buy my preferred shares? You buy them and you get special rights. For example, this is the classic. I, I promise you a specific dividend. You buy my shares, you're a preferred shareholder now, and it could say something like, you will get 3% dividend, guaranteed. Important to know, preference shares are, like all these shares, the result of legal contracts. As such, they can look very differently. So the preferred share of one company could look fundamentally different from preferred shares of another company, depending on what I write in this contract, essentially. A classic would be that preferred shareholders get a guaranteed dividend, which is slightly higher than the normal dividend that goes to ordinary shareholders. What is it that you have to give, give up in order for this preferential treatment? Often, it's very common, preferred shares don't have a voting right. Could very well be, okay? So you get a little bit more cash, but you get less decision power. Nobody cares about your vote in a shareholder meeting because you're a preferred shareholder, okay? So preference means that the holder of the preference shares must receive a dividend before holders of ordinary shares. So I've seen this in my papers now. When I studied real companies, the companies all had ordinary shares outstanding and preferred shares outstanding, and they made losses, losses, losses. At some point, they made a profit, and then they were discussing what should we do with the profit, but they don't have to discuss it because the fact that they had preferred shares outstanding means 
they are not allowed to pay any dividend to anybody else before the preferred shareholders have been paid. And in reality, very often it says that also goes backwards in time. So if for three years I have made losses, I have not paid any dividends, not to ordinary and not to preferred shareholders, and then I make profits, I have to go back in time essentially and catch up with all the preferred dividends first, dividend payments first, before I can even consider paying out dividends to my ordinary shareholders. Okay, that's what this means. So preference shares can be viewed as equity or debt, depending on the exact characteristics of, of, the, of the thing, of the security, of the financial instrument. I have a bit more here. So preference shareholders or preferred shareholders receive a, state, a stated dividend only if the corporation is liquidated, they get the stated value. This is quite common and this here is now key. This is very technical, okay? We need to look at accounting law to figure out under which condition is a preferred share treated like debt and under which condition is it treated like equity. I'll, I will translate. So where do you need to look? You would look in IFRS, IAS, international accounting standards, international financial reporting standards. It's European accounting law, essentially. That tells us, number 32, tells us exactly how that is treated. So, preference shares should be, uh, how they should be regarded. Number one, if a preference share can be seen as debt, if there is a contractually fixed dividend payment, as I've said, I guarantee you a fixed dividend, which expires or is redeemed at a fixed future date. So that's exactly what I've described before. A preference share would be viewed as debt if I, the company, have promised you that you receive a specific dividend at a specific date, and that's compulsory. Why can I say this is then more like debt? Because if I say you have bought my equity, preferred shares are still equity, but I promise you every year a certain payment of X percent of my profit, how is this in reality then different from an interest expense that I pay on a loan? From my perspective, it will feel the same if I pay you 3% uh, dividend on your preferred shares versus I pay an interest rate of 3% on a loan. For me, in my wallet, it will feel exactly the same. So those guaranteed dividend payments feel to me like an interest expense. They are not, technically of course not, but that's why you can say, well, if you guarantee fixed dividends, it's like paying an interest expense, and that feels then more like you have issued a debt instrument, okay? A preference share will be treated, will be regarded as more equity-like if it's not obligated to pay a dividend or it has a specific maturity date where this expires, okay? So very specifically, how would you distinguish between debt and equity? It depends on the terms, the specific legal terms of the actual financial instrument preference shares. If I guarantee you a specific dividend to be paid at a specific point in the future, it is more a debt instrument, otherwise it's more an equity instrument. Okay? Like I said, this is something the book spends really like a, a, a sort of sub-chapter on it. I would consider this a more tricky question. I don't know that you, uh, on the exam, if I grade myself, I, I would not insist that you know the exact IAS, IAS, IFRS article. But I would, I mean, this, I would be willing to give full points on something like this if a student says, the question is, uh, make the case that preferred shares can be viewed as debt. If you write down, a preference share is a share that equips the preferred shareholder with special rights. A common special right would be a slightly higher dividend as well as a guaranteed dividend. These guaranteed dividend payments in terms of cash flow very much resemble the fixed interest expense payments. The end. I would give full points. Okay? So all of this is more background and specific details would not be required for, for, for me being willing to give full points. Is it clear? Let me check the chat briefly, guys. Okay, this is cool. Let me look at the YouTube chat. 
Some of these theory questions are not in the lecture slides. Does that mean we still need to study the book? Well, obviously, we've said this a million times, right? Yeah, obviously. Also, my slides in the lecture very, contain very few questions in general. So when you say some of these theory questions are not in the lecture slides, I mean, all of my theory questions are not on the lecture slides, right? Additional questions for you. What, what else could somebody ask you about this chapter? What is a sinking fund? There's a big concept that pops up in this chapter all the time. That's like a basic definition. What does the term security in the context of long-term financing refer to? Define the term indenture. This is all basic terminology. If you look at the chapter summary at the end of the book, this is, this is like a glossary, right? Otherwise, we cannot speak about this. These are just basic definitions. What's a covenant? Have, we have discussed this in great detail. Positive covenants, negative covenants. Give three examples. Remember, I told you I bought my house in Delft and the bank says, hey, Flo, you're not allowed to rent it out to somebody. So that's a negative covenant. You are not allowed to do this. Why not? This whole storyline. What's the difference between cumulative dividends and non-cumulative dividends? That's obviously a bit more of a detailed question, but huge section in the book, okay? Again, this is a possible exam question. You're smart enough, you know me and Celine easily well enough to, to answer yourself, is this a likely exam question, all right? Capital structure. Let's look a little bit at capital structure. Which questions could you be easily asked in the context of everything capital structure, the basics? Explain Modigliani Miller, Proposition 1, in a world with no taxes. What is the key message? What's the core of it? Explain Modigliani Miller, Proposition 2, in a, you see, same question, Proposition 1, Proposition 2, in a world with no taxes. What is the key message? What is the tax shield? Explain Modigliani Miller, Proposition 1, with taxes. What is the key message? Explain Modigliani Miller, Proposition 2, with corporate taxes. What's the key message? There's not all that much that we, we can talk about here. So first question, Modigliani Miller, Proposition 1, no taxes, what's the core? I would say this, this literally from my slides. The value of the levered firm equals is the same as the value of the unlevered firm. That is the core, that is the key message. You can of course elaborate why is that. Strictly speaking, here the question does not call for it. Typically on the exam, we have a disclaimer very early on in the exam that says for all questions, substantiate your answer, right? So it's not enough to simply say this is it, but explain why is that. So what's the key message? The value of a levered firm is the same as the value of an unlevered firm. And Modigliani Miller showed a very simple thing. They basically said based on the fact that uh, an investor could engage in homemade leverage, it simply should not matter. You can phrase this in different ways, like I do here, like we discussed in class, but this is the core. Value levered equals value unlevered. Why? Because in Modigliani Miller world with no taxes, homemade leverage is easily possible. So a shareholder would not care. Therefore the values would be equal. Second question, explain Modigliani Miller proposition two in a world with no taxes. What is the key message? Proposition two, is of course, well, a couple of, 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 of starting points. Levered equity has a greater risk. Why? Because the waiting line in front of the shareholders gets longer. So the shareholders are the last in line. The, the, we have discussed in the concept of long-term debt. Debt can never be subordinated to equity. So the shareholders, the ordinary shareholders will always be in the back of the waiting line. So because they expose themselves to a greater risk, they want a greater expected return to be compensated for the higher risk. Okay, and Modigliani Miller argue that the expected return on equity is positively related to leverage, so meaning the more, the more. Return on equity will go up as leverage goes up, so as the firm borrows more and more money. Why? Because the risk to the equity holders, the shareholders, goes up as you increase leverage. How do you have to picture this? I'm the firm, you're a shareholder, I'm levering up, 
the more I lever up, the longer the waiting line in front of you in case I go bankrupt will become, meaning the further back in the waiting line you are, the higher the risk that in the case of bankruptcy of me, you get nothing. Higher risk means you will wanna be compensated for this with a higher return on equity. Core message. For this, I would give full points. If this is the question, oops, if this is the question, full points. I have a, a very important thing here. I don't know if I told you this, um, but I have an elective I teach in the, uh, in the third year. The elective is essentially called fraud. It's corporate fraud. It's a 10-week course, very intense, six hours, lectures a week, huge assignments. It's a crazy in-depth course on fraud investigation, everything related to this. And they also, these students also get an open question exam. And a lot of students after the exam told me, oof, that was, I really had a time crunch. This was a very long exam. It was very difficult to just manage in time. And then I graded and I saw like three quarters of the students wasted time in this way. Let me show you. All these questions on your exam would be open questions, right? So you read the question, then you have a text box where you can add text. So let's say the question is, explain Modigliani-Miller proposition one, in a world with no taxes, what is the key message? On the fraud exam, many of my students have then started their answer like you would write an essay. In the following paragraph, I will attempt now to explain the reasoning behind Modigliani-Miller proposition one, it should be noted that this will pertain to a world without... No, don't do this. I, re I know the questions. You don't need to restate the question. Don't make it an essay. It's not a thesis, okay? I don't reiterate what the question was. Answer it. Bullet points if possible. Full sentences where needed. Don't make this an essay. A as short as possible, as long as necessary. Don't write an essay, okay? Don't reiterate and waste minutes or, 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 or yeah, in total 15 minutes just by restating the questions we ask, okay? Don't do this. I, I didn't think I need to, to say it, but I, it, it, it's so common. Please don't. Uh, what is the tax shield? I don't even wanna talk about this anymore because you all know it and I'm sure you also don't wanna talk about it anymore. Well, what is the tax shield? Well. The consideration was this, whatever the taxes that a company would normally pay each year without debt, if it were an all equity for firm, the firm will pay less taxes if they have debt. But how much less tax will they pay? Well, they will pay corporate tax rate multiplied with cost of debt, multiplied with amount of debt less. So that is the mathematic formula. What are the components here? Well, obviously TC is the corporate tax rate and the term RD multiplied with D is of course the interest expense that you pay. How much money did you borrow from me? That's D, 100 euro. How much do you have to pay for it? RD, 4%. 4% multiplied with 100 euro is 4 euro. That is from your perspective, your interest expense. Boom. If you multiply it with the corporate tax rate, it will tell you the amount of money that you will pay less taxes because interest expenses are tax deductible. I'm not gonna ask if it's clear because I know we have done this ad nauseam. What was question D? Explain Modigliani Miller proposition one with corporate taxes, what's the key message? Yeah, it's this. Leverage increases of course the value of the company. Why? Because you get to enjoy the tax shield. Tax shield is corporate tax rate multiplied with the amount of multiplied with the amount of debt. If it is a perpetual tax shield, which is a fair assumption, we have discussed this in the lecture. You remember this. Then I end up with corporate tax rate multiplied with D. So we only need to add now the tax shield to the value of an unlevered firm, if we are in a world with taxes, to get the value of the levered firm. So what is the core message now? value of a levered firm equals the value of an unlevered firm plus the present value of a perpetual tax shield. If you get something like this, you will hear my voice on the exam for sure. Everybody remembers this, guys. Let me check the chat quickly.
If I see maybe someone can ask the question with a mic on, you can ask it yourself. Don't be shy. Come on, guys. We've spent, what, eight weeks together? This is... Let me see. What, what question... Does the exam take calculations into account as well? Does the exam take calculations into account as well? I mean, half of your exam is going to be calculations, so I'm not really sure. Because we've been told the exam is only final result, but just now you implied otherwise. I'm not sure I understand the question. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Um, we were told uh, to only fit in the, um, the final answer. Yeah. Like, uh, like calculations, uh, you, you cannot answer them or they, they, will, they will not look at the calculation, only final answer. Do you understand? E yeah. But you know, on the exam, yeah, sure. But you, yeah. For example, only 16%, not, um, yeah, not the whole, sure, not the whole way of the calculation. Yeah, sure. But, but, but earlier today you said um, if you make a small mistake in uh, RD, for example, um, you can just keep on calculating. But that, uh, yeah, I okay, I understand the question. It depends a little bit what you're able, I, I'm, I'm not sure um, what you're actually going to hand in, right? Because realistically, you will need some side calculations. If you do this on the computer, we are able to see this. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that is going to be with, um, with the paper, if you don't do it on the computer, but you just do side calculations, if you have to hand it in or not. But on a potential perusal, this is then an argument that you could theoretically make, right? Uh, but in principle, it's correct. Wait, 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 wait I'm talking. Wait. But in principle, um, uh, for the calculation questions, you have then one box where you type in a number, so we can grade it automatically, right? So then, let's say the correct result is four euro. Uh, we include then a rounding range, and we basically tell ANS if it's four euro plus or minus 0 0.5, still treat it as correct. So that's how the computer then automatically grades. Everything else that I can see from your exam, we theoretically would include in the grading. So what I said before, if you calculate a whole, you know, like whatever, WACC, if I see the side calculation then on the perusal, right, if, if that is available, then you, ca you could get points for in-between results, theoretically. It will depend, and that's again, like I said, please discuss with Celine, it's calculation stuff, it's her, it's her domain. Please ask her what exactly you will be supposed to hand in. Is it only the number you type in, or will you also be essentially forced to hand in your scribbling paper, which we have then available for our grading, right? So that's, that's for clarification with Celine then. Clear what I mean? Uh, understood. Check with her, but really check with her because realistically you must have some sort of side calculations, right? Not, none of the stuff we do you can calculate in your head. Realistically there will be side calculations. Please make sure to ask Celine in the workshop where will you do these side calculations and will they be handed in? That, is, that matters. Because if you don't hand them in, we can, cannot consider them for grading. If they are handed in with the exams together, they, they can of course uh, be counted in your favor, right? Like we discussed at the very beginning, if you make a calculation mistake somewhere along the way, you could then still theoretically get points. Please verify with Celine. Yeah. Nice, you're most welcome, of course. Okay, and last but not least, what did we have? Last question, explain Modigliani Miller Proposition 2 with corporate taxes, what's the key message? All right, Proposition 2, uh, we have a positive relationship between expected return on equity and leverage. The same intuition holds in a world with corporate taxes. If you think about this, it's the same formula, if you want to call it that, as in a world with no taxes, only expanded by the term 1 minus TC to reflect the fact that, of course, interest expenses are tax deductible. All right? The same intuition we have in a world with corporate taxes. 
Additional questions for you. Again, simply for, for brainstorming uh, that, you, that you practice a little bit stuff outside of Connect. Is Modigli Modigliani Miller in a world with no taxes realistic? Why or why not? But give a more nuanced answer than simply saying, because in the real world there are taxes. Okay? Secondly, what would Modigliani Miller Proposition 1 with corporate taxes predict to occur in the real world? Does it occur? Why or why not? Explain the effect of personal taxes on capital structure. We've discussed this in the context of dividend policy quite a bit. I find as a super explanation page 416 and the following. Okay? So I'm not, again, I'm not trying to say this is everything and capturing everything. A couple of questions where I thought, yeah, that would be fair questions. I would be comfortable asking you any of this. Couple of questions about limits to the use of debt. What are direct costs of financial distress? What are indirect costs of financial distress? Explain what the expression agency costs refers to in the context of financial distress. What does the expression milking the property refer to? I mean, just to zoom in on this, how often have we spoken about this in the presence of debt? Maximizing shareholder value does not need to be the same as maximizing um, firm value. So I could pay out dividends to my shareholders in times of financial distress or as I'm approaching financial distress so that when I go bankrupt, there's less money available for the bondholders. How should we call this? Milking the property. That's what it's called. How can the cost of debt be reduced? I remember very vividly when we had the lecture where I told you, what can we do to drive it down? Promise the bank that is giving us loans all kinds of things to lower their risk. For example, like I promised my bank, I will not rent out my apartment. If I'm a company, what could I promise my bank? I will not sell significantly big assets without informing the bank. Or I promise the bank to keep my working capital at a minimum level of this. So basically everything covenant related is correct here. What is the key message of packing order theory? So all of this, I'm 100% sure if I were to say the exam is now, this is it. You have to do it now. I give you 15 minutes. I'm sure all of you could score full points here. 100%. Okay, so I don't want to go through this because this is so recently that it's, it's, it's basically boring. I don't believe for a second that you are struggling with this. Let's see what else I have. Additional questions, because that's why we're here, right? What else would be a, 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 a realistic exam question? Describe the selfish investment strategy incentive to take lar large risks. We spoke about this, right? Remember when we said in the presence of debt, maximizing shareholder value does not need to be the same as maximizing firm value. And we spoke about three specific things. Milking the property, underinvestment, and incentive to take large risks. Okay, there are three beautiful slides, subchapters in the book. Something we have discussed extensively with numeric examples just to basically drive home the point. Under investment is immediately the next question. Under investment, we had milking the property, and here are the other two. Large risk taking, under investment. Give at least three examples of a positive covenant. Positive covenants are all those things you promise the bank, somebody, if the, the, the party that is financing you, that start with you should. You should keep your working capital this high. You should do this. You should do that. You should send your annual report to the bank to keep them informed. Positive covenants. And give three examples of negative covenants. That are all those rules, all those clauses we agree to that start with, you are not allowed to. You are not, please don't do this. In the book, it's just lists off. Many of them we have discussed just in class briefly here and there. Explain market timing. We have discussed this as well. When, in the context of packing order, right? Let me go back. Where is it? In the context of packing order, why does equity come last in the packing order? Because, I, 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 I told you then, lemons market, because there's, of course, 
information asymmetry. When would a manager very likely issue equity? When the manager thinks it's overvalued. Okay. Where is it? Uh, explain the term signaling. We have discussed this great detail, right? Also in the context of the used car market, the lemons market, where I said the used car market does not break down. We do not see market failure because used car salesmen are clearly experienced in signaling of sorts. So I can make, send a credible signal to you that the car I'm selling to you is really a good car by, for example, promising you if anything breaks down in the next three years, just bring it and I will repair it for you for free. That would be an example of signaling. What does shirking refer to? Great explanation, page 439 and the following. Okay. Couple of questions about dividend policy. Again, I just want to go through it because the idea is today to give you some more ideas how we ask questions, what you could expect. What is a stock split? Explain the expression homemade dividends. What does the expression dividend signaling refer to? What's the clientele effect? Give two arguments in favor of paying dividends. Give two examples uh, against paying dividends. All of this, remember, so it's just one slide. Pros and cons of dividends, right? Just to, uh, to refresh your memory, what are arguments in favor of paying dividends? The more dividends I pay out to you, my shareholders, the less money is left in the company for me to engage in what we call discretionary spending, which is fancy language for wasting it on non-value adding crap, basically. Okay. Uh, an example um, against paying dividends, the more dividends I pay out, they are paid out of the retained earnings, the less internal funds are available, remain in the company. And that is a problem if you look at the world through the lens of pecking order. Because pecking order theory says, step one, use your internal funds. If I use all the internal funds to pay dividends to you guys, there's nothing left. And I might have to forego value adding net pre um, uh, positive net present value investment opportunities. Okay. Okay, and I have added here, of course, the answers that you can click through a little bit. And this is, yeah, oh, some more. List and describe. Real world considerations for why some firms prefer repurchases over dividends. We've discussed this as well. Taxation, right? What does the term dividend policy refer to? Is it the same as dividends, right? Do dividends matter? Does dividend policy matter? That's not exactly the same thing, okay? Review. Describe the catering theory of dividends. What does the expression dividend smoothing refer to? That's a, uh, something I would consider more of a detail from the book. I would not classify this here as an obvious question that everybody immediately needs to know from the top of their head. But for example, catering, dividend policy, this is stuff all of you, I would expect to, to ace. What is a reverse stock split? Okay, so that's it. So I hope that you are able to see that the, the questions, the, we, we are not asking trick questions, okay? That, that's not what we do, that we sit down. How can we formulate a question in the most screwed up way to trick students into basically deliberately giving the wrong answer? We don't do this at all, okay? If we ask what is A, then please answer what is A and don't try to get in our head and maybe they mean no. The, the questions we ask, answer them really at face value, essentially. Uh, what is also maybe relevant for you to know, most questions don't require long answers. You've seen this now also on my slide set. Um, Okay, that's a bad example because I copied in a lot. But if you think about the Modigliani-Miller questions, I think they were very nice. What is the core message of Modigliani-Miller? Let me show you. Mm, like this here. This is, I would give full points on this. Everything is here. What is the core message of Modigliani-Miller? Proposition 2 in a world with taxes. One sentence what Modigliani-Miller Proposition 2 in a world without taxes says. Then... The same intuition also holds in a world with taxes and the formula. So there is no way, even if I would hate you and I want you to fail and I want to do everything I can to downgrade you, I couldn't. This 
three sent two sentences and one formula, full points, okay? So please don't think that every question needs a very long answer. That is not the case, okay? Brief to the point, as long as necessary. Don't write whole narratives. Don't write an essay with introduction and climax and no, to the point, okay? Let me have a look at the chat very quickly. I don't want to overlook anything. Yeah, from my perspective, when you say, does he just miss this question each time? <laughs> What's going on? You have to imagine I have two chats open, both very active. I have to manage a lot of technology at the same time I'm talking to you and think about content and how to didactically explain it in a meaningful way. My multitasking is not great and it really only goes so far. That's the explanation. I'm not ignoring anything uh, deliberately. Uh, calculation section, let me see. All slides, you asked this many times, I've said always the same thing. I share all my slides with you in the exact same way you see it. That is not a secret, I will put them on canvas. I saw a typo and one, the, one instance where I didn't do the color coding perfectly. I usually fix those things and put it on canvas as you've seen it. Uh, are you allowed to use English terminology in combination with the Dutch explanation? Yeah, absolutely. If, you, if, if the occasional asset or return slips out. In reality, it would also be like this, right? Uh, you, no matter what your language is, um, you would still use certain uh, technical terms in English most likely. So that's that's perfectly fine, yeah. Will we also get this exact same recording? Yeah, absolutely. So the moment I end the live stream, it's briefly not available for you, not because I, 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 I make it so, but because uh, within YouTube it's converted in some internal whatever format and depending on how long a stream is, it Sometimes it's shorter and sometimes longer. So if this is a relatively long stream, then uh, that will take probably, I don't know, two hours, something like this. Uh, I have set it to public. I'm checking now my YouTube monitor. Yeah, it's set to public. So the moment it's fully converted within YouTube, it just becomes a normal YouTube clip that you find on the channel under live streams. Because I have no pre-recorded videos, they're all under live streams. Yes, and I'm not editing this in any way exactly as you see. Should we answer all questions with a formula writing down? I don't know. I cannot answer this because I don't understand. I don't, I'm reluctant to say you should answer all questions in the same way. You, you know how this is, right? When we speak in class, when you speak with Celine in the workshop, when I ask you a question, when Celine asks you a question, we usually care about what's your answer and then I usually follow up with, but why did you say this? Give me, give me your reasoning. That's a good governing logic for the exam, okay? Um, okay, let me check the YouTube chat. I don't want to overlook something here either. I see here both the theory questions and calculation questions are open questions, which means we are expected to write in sentences. Is that right? Um, I would not say it like this. So technically, yes, technically that is a correct statement that your calculation questions as well as your uh, theory questions are open questions. But I would not say that the calculation questions are truly open if you can only input one number as a result, right? It's like a, it's not multiple choice, but you can only answer with one number. So you don't obviously need to write a full sentence there. Um, we are expected to write in sentences. No, I would not say that this is correct. You are not expected to write in sentences. I mean, I'm not going to make this an English grammar exam. I'm not going to criticize your style. Pay attention that your answer is accurate, okay? So it cannot be so short that it is, is, is too generic to be graded as fully correct. But if this is bullet points, it's perfectly fine, right? I mean, a lot of the stuff I put here um, on my slides are sentence fragments. That's perfectly fine. As long, if I were to show you this, the message is crystal clear and that's obviously not a beautiful essay either, right? Sometimes I use full sentences. Sometimes like here, it's just fragments. That's perfectly fine. 
it's very clear what my answer is. It's very clear that I understood the question and that I have studied it and can explain it correctly, that you would not lose points because it's not a full sentence. No. But make sure that you express yourself in such a way that it is clear to us what you mean, okay? If there's room for interpretation, it's difficult. Then most likely it will not mean full points, simply because, yeah, then it's too, too unspecific. Let me see. Will we have one question about sustainable finance in the exam? Yes. Uh, yes, I said that, Celine said that, uh, there will be one sustainable question on the exam. Obviously, we have invited a guest lecturer, a very valued colleague, who is an expert on that. Um, logically, again, what realistically does somebody like me and somebody like Celine, what are we going to ask you about sustainable finance? Sure, there are all kinds of weird details, and I, I of course, saw what, what Dirk teaches. I, I told you I record the videos for his book. So I know that he showed you all kinds of formulas. Ask yourself, knowing what you know about me, knowing what you know about Celine, are we really interested in asking you about obscure formulas? We are interested in big picture stuff and that you are able to, to, to understand big picture stuff, not in, in, in super great detail, okay? So big stuff that Dirk spoke about is of course relevant, absolutely. One question, yes. Um, let me see, let me scroll up. I don't want to overlook anything on YouTube either. Nice. Nice. I think we got it. All right, guys. Then going forward, what am I going to do next? I will, I have a second slide set, Theory Bomb 2. The, I, I'm not fully done yet. It's, for, for now, I think it's just 20 slides. I will add maybe 15 more because as you've seen, I've not shown you anything today about options or about the later chapters yet. So I want to create a couple of those questions as well. And I will simply put it on canvas. Just again, same idea as today to give you a little bit more of an idea what are questions that we are interested in asking in those areas. Okay? And please don't misunderstand me. This is not like the question pool. And from these questions, we select what we put on the exam. The idea is to show you questions that resemble exam questions, okay? All right, guys, please don't panic, please don't freak out and don't drive each other crazy, okay? Don't, don't search actively for weird footnotes or, or, or weird details. Focus on the, on the stuff we have discussed. Um, some students asked me, would it be enough if I only studied the, the slides from the lectures? So maybe I want to end on this. I think so. I told you I don't show up to class and just talk about random crap, right? I really think about what is meaningful, what is so challenging that by talking about it in class with you, I think I can add value and make it a more more straightforward, maybe more pleasurable experience for you. So that's very deliberate what I speak about, and it's very deliberate what um, what what of course Celine speaks about. Um, I, I'm quite proud of my slides. So if I think if you only, I'm only speaking about the theory part of the exam now. If you only study my slides, I mean to perfection, I would say, and you understand it, probability that you pass the exam close to 100%. Probably it's not going to be a 10.0 though. But if your main worry is failing the exam, there's not all that much required, okay? So even if you never bought the book, I think you would pass the theory part relatively decently even, okay? Um, oh yeah, I'm curious about the option for the house in Mallorca. Briefly explain what's a good or bad option and why. Yes, I'm happy to do this very quickly. So I shared with my friend, I took screenshots of the stuff you sent me, I forwarded Excel sheets, and in our last call, we call once, once a week and talk on the phone in the evening for four hours. We went through all of this and discussed it. And uh, everything I've seen, I would treat basically as correct. You have noticed that there are only two variables where we can really discuss what we should fill in. The risk-free rate, that's where your answers differed as well. Some of you used short-term rates from Germany, from the US, so there would be differences here. Uh, and there would be differences in, of course, the variance, right? The variance of the price of the underlying. 
So some of you said, okay, well, Mallorca is an island, but it belongs to Spain. So some of you looked up the variance of real estate prices across Spain. It's a technically correct approach. It is not the most fine-grained approach because Spain is a huge country and Mallorca is an island that is very at a very different place, right? So it could be that the real estate market from Mallorca is completely disconnected from mainland Spain, uh, which to some degree it actually is. So some of you said, no, I want to do it a little bit more fine-grained. And you looked up the variance of real estate on Mallorca only. Not all of Spain, only Mallorca. Definitely, that's way more accurate. The best would be, that's what I would do. I know exactly what kind of houses my friend likes. So I would probably get in touch with, um, what's it called in English? In Dutch it's called Maklar. Um, real estate agent, sorry. Real estate agents ask for the price development of very similar houses as the house that my friend likes, let's say 10 of them, and ask them for the price development of those 10 houses, calculate the variance of those 10 representative houses myself, and use that as a variance, because that's then really a self-created, very, very similar benchmark to what I'm interested in. And all of you reached the same conclusion that the option was clearly not priced using Black Shoals, that the option, if you were to price it correctly using Black Shoals, the actual purchase price was way too low, so it, would, it should be way, way higher. And there was one uh, message in the group chat that I liked so much that I spoke with my friend about it very long. Forgive me, I don't recall the name now, but one of you said, let's not forget that this is not only a finance exercise. Let's not forget that a house on Mallorca or a house anywhere represents all kinds of positive things, right? That's your home, that's where you meet your friends, that's where you have awesome barbecue evenings and open a couple of beers and, and sit in the sun. So, so the whole calculation does not capture everything that is important to us, all this emotional stuff. So uh, I think it's a, 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 was a great comment and, and we just spoke about this one comment easily for 20 minutes, yes. So I think you did a great job. I wanted to uh, recall one more thing. I asked you, or I suggested, maybe have a look at James Bond Casino Royale. Did some of you do this? Did you have a look at Casino Royale with Daniel Craig? Seeing nothing in the chat. Yes. Can somebody tell me, maybe just in a couple of words, what was the plan of the bad guy? And does it involve options? What, what, what was he doing? No need to be shy. Yeah, tell me. That means that we inspected the price of the entire like company to go down. So probably they have more technical option mm -hmm. so that they can buy it for a fixed, I mean, strike price. Mm -hmm. Whereas the market price would like go super down and it would like profit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely correct. So the bad guy in James Bond Casino Royale knows the following thing. There is an airline, a fic I think it's a fictitious airline in the movie, and they have bought a new airplane, a prototype. It's bigger, it's massive, it's awesome. And the bad guy thinks like this. The, the airline will reveal in a huge ceremony in front of the public, of course, their new airplane. And the bad guy plans an attack on the airplane. So he pays a guy to plant a bomb on the airplane and blow it up. And uh, the, the logic of, of, of of the bad guy is as follows. If you destroy the airplane of an airline, he thinks it will make the, the stock price crash. I ask you specifically pay attention to what, what the bad guy is thinking about the net present value. I think he thinks the following. If the airline gets a new huge plane with several hundred seats inside, that represents a lot of ticket sales. If he destroys the airplane, that will clearly influence the net present value of all the future earnings of this airline because this one asset will be gone. So the net present value of the whole company will go down, divided by a number of shares outstanding, share price will go down. So early on in the movie, the bad guy actually is speculating against the market. The company will reveal their airplane 
Everybody expects the market to react positively to this. The company has a new asset that will generate earnings. And the bad guy thinks if I blow up the plane, it will crash. Nobody expects this, of course not, but he will do the bombing. Okay, but very early on in the movie, he says he's short selling it. Short selling means you sell shares that you don't even have. So his idea is he sells shares now for, let's say, 100 that he doesn't even have and promises to deliver them in, let's say, a week. Selling shares now for the price now of, let's say, 100 delivered in a week. You give me 100 now and I will give you the 100 shares in a week. But if I don't have the shares myself, I need to first buy them. But the bad guy is blowing up the airplane or wants to, so he thinks if he's short selling shares, selling shares that he doesn't have, then destroy the plane, the price will crash, then he will buy the shares cheaply and can deliver. However, James Bond, of course, beats the living crap out of the guy with the bomb. I mean, just this scene alone is amazing. So the plane does not get blown up and the bad guy suffers a huge financial damage because the stock price really, as predicted, goes up. But in the second scene of the bad guy, his investment banker calls the bad guy and says, Sir, your puts have expired. That's why I said in my message, is this even an option trade? If, if we're talking about put options, like this message, Sir, your puts have expired, then obviously he has indeed bought put options, right? But at the very beginning of the movie, he says he's short selling shares. So what is it? Did he sh sell shares that he didn't have or did he buy put options? So both would make some sort of financial sense, but you cannot do both. I mean, it makes no sense to mix this, okay? So clearly Hollywood does not know finance as well as we do, all right? Okay, guys, let's stop here. I've kept you way too long already. Um, it's a bit sad for me that we have our last lecture in this setting. I hope that there will be some opportunity before Christmas for a couple of drinks on campus. If you plan on grabbing drinks, possibly uh, before, shoot me a quick message. Officially, I mean, the moment I end the live stream, I will take off my clothes and my vacation starts. But my vacation means I will be home in Delft working on my own research paper. So I'm, I would be most, most happy and relieved if at some point I get a message from a couple of you, hey Flo, Let's grab drinks on campus. Any excuse to get away from, from research for a bit, I would love. So please don't be shy. For the exam, be cool, be calm, don't panic. It's an exam, okay? It will not predetermine your future. It does not predetermine your career. It's just an exam. If you fail it, so what? There's a reset. Do it again. Later on, after your graduate from the bachelor, from your master, nobody will look at your second year bachelor grade of anything, okay? Take it seriously, but don't, don't beat yourself up uh, and don't work yourself into a workout, okay? Uh, I will be a little bit less responsive, but not unresponsive. I still have my phone. I'm officially on vacation, but of course, if something dramatic happens, please reach out. Let me know if I can help in some way, all right? Guys, enjoy the day. Do the best you can on the exam, and I hope we see each other soon on campus with a cold beer in our hands. All right. See you guys. Oh, see you guys. Thanks. It's very sweet. Thanks for the messages, guys. See you. Thank you. Bye. See you guys. Feine Dach. Bye. YouTube viewers, see you soon. <laughs>